On behalf of the American Enterprise Institute, I want to welcome all of you here today for this uh, very important discussion. My name is John Cusey. I manage government relations for the American Enterprise Institute, and we are very uh, excited about this two-day program uh, that we've put together with Brookings and the Secretary's Innovation Group. Um, this is something that uh, is very important to the American Enterprise Institute. We've been working with uh, Richard Burkhauser on uh, a number of uh, ideas for um, changes in the disability program, but also just focusing on not just numbers, but that this is a population uh, that we care about a lot and we want to make sure that they uh, have the best services and the best outcomes. Um, so we're thrilled that you were interested enough uh, to come and join us today. Hopefully you will join us on the second day of the program as well. Um, but thank you very much uh, for coming. I'm going to hand it to Steve here. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm the executive director, Jason Turner, of the uh, Secretary's Innovation Group. This is a network organization made up of 16 human service secretaries from around the country uh, representing uh, a little bit over half of the population of, a, of, the, of the United States. Uh, we're very pleased as our secretaries, uh, our secretary members are concerned about the disability uh, uh, system as it's currently um, uh, uh, set up. So we're pleased to have this opportunity to have a, a, a frank and open discussion with uh, the, some of the best ex experts on this who are in this room. I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Ron Haskins of Brookings. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, it's great to be here back in this room. The room brings back a lot of memories to me. Welfare reform was written in this very room, and we had fair, fairly active discussions here with various people calling each other names and so forth. So hopefully we won't do that today. Uh, Brookings has had some involvement with the SSDI program in the last year. We sponsored Jack Smulligan from OMB, who came to Brookings for six months and worked on this issue, wrote a paper, and that concluded with a conference uh, that we held uh, at, at Brookings several months ago. Before that, we sponsored an issue of the Future of Children, which was on disabled children, uh, and we wrote a policy brief on the SSI program. We had an event at Brookings on that. So this is kind of a third installment, and we're very, very pleased. Uh, the schedule for this one is tighter than anything I think I've ever been involved in. Uh, so that's it. All I'm going to say, except to say that our first speaker is Mark Duggan, who's the professor and chair of business economics and public policy at the Wharton Public Policy Initiative. Uh, you have bio biographical information, so we're not going to waste our time saying a lot about background. Besides that, I think most people here know each other. So, Mark, thank you. Okay, great. Should I be setting my stopwatch for the nine minutes this allotted. Woman yeah. Right here, this woman is a yeah. Black okay. Black I'm gonna. Here. Okay. Here we go. I'm. I'm really honored to be here, um, presenting about this uh, very important program that I've been studying for a long time, and uh, I'm excited that uh, to have a mix of uh, people with so much uh, experience on the front lines of policymaking here. Um, so let's see. I've got to first figure out the clicker. So today I'll be um, talking about. Um, whether the growth in SSDI can be sustained in, uh, 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 in the years ahead. And there are a couple of hypotheses that Jason asked uh, me to explore here. Uh, this one along with whether uh, fundamental restructuring is required. So I'm going to focus on the first of these today. Um, basically, over the last 25 or 30 years, there has been very rapid growth in the SSDI program. Uh, uh, since the late 1980s, and that's actually what drew me to studying this program in the late 1990s as a graduate student. I've been studying it sort of ever since. Uh, this growth, uh, for the most part, and I'll talk about this, was not pr predicted by the Office of the Actuaries. There are some uh, exceptions to that, but in general, much more often than not, the program has surged far beyond what OACT projected. Uh, it is also not due mostly, I, and I think there are a lot of reasons that SSDI enrollment has grown. One is the baby boomers are aging. Another is that more women are becoming eligible for the program. But those are really not the driving factors in the growth in the program. Um, but I think the first step today is to acknowledge whether there is a problem, whether, this, whether enrollment is really growing or whether it's just the natural consequence of an aging population. So why has it grown so much? Uh, the, it is not mainly due to uh, aging and more women working. Um, and this is really, it is true that in the mid-1990s there, there was a projection by OACT 
uh, uh, that lined up with uh, what happened in the years ahead, but in general, as you'll see in a minute, um, much more often than not, that was not the case. So in general, I served on a technical panel uh, for the Social Security Advisory Board to get under, sort of scrutinize the assumptions and methodology used by the Office of the Actuary. And as you'll see, you can see in that report, which is available, publicly available online, um, the sense of the panel was that OACT is systematically understating going forward. So as you can see here from this figure, the fraction of the U.S. population receiving SSDI benefits has been steadily growing um, since the late 1980s. So it's basically more than doubled since the late 1980s. And this growth has occurred both among men and women. So the series on the top is the fraction of men um, receiving SSDI benefits between 25 and 64. And below that is the fraction of women. And part of the reason that the growth among women has been much greater than the growth among men is that more women are working, and in order to be eligible for SSDI benefits, as um, many of you know, you have to have worked for at least, let's say, five of the 10 most recent years. That's, that's one requirement in the program. But so basically, you can see it is higher for women than for men, which is consistent with this idea that part of what's going on is the fraction of people who's insured, but that's not the only story. And you can also see here, if you look by age group, uh, look, you drill down within narrow age groups, and you can see that the, the likelihood that a person is receiving SSDI benefits has grown substantially. So take, for example, people in their early 50s. From 1989 to 2011, the fraction of people receiving SSDI benefits in that group more than doubled. Okay? It is true there was an increase in the fraction of people who were insured for the program, but nowhere close to that kind of increase. Okay? And that's been going on. It's been going on for the last five years, for the last 10 years, for the last 15 years. This growth has been uh, ongoing uh, steadily. And this is what's driving the growth in SSDI enrollment, not that, yes, pe more people are sliding into, let's say, the early 60s age group, which mechanically is going to tend to raise enrollment. But the bigger story is that any per person hold fix their characteristics, they're vastly more likely to receive benefits from the program. And sort of what you've seen in this program is it's just dramatically changed with respect to uh, the conditions with which people are qualifying. So here, I break up into five categories, the, uh, the primary diagnosis uh, for people. And if you look, circulatory conditions, so these are strokes, heart attacks typically, are flat. Neoplasms are flat. Both of those are conditions where there's base often an objective test that can determine, did he have a heart attack? Did she, does she have cancer? Uh, instead, the growth has been in these other, fact these other categories, like musculoskeletal, uh, very commonly back pain uh, or mental disorders. If you look, musculoskeletal increased. It's six times higher, the award rate, six times higher in 2009 than it was in the mid-1980s. Similarly, for mental, it's three times higher than it was in the mid-1980s. No change in, uh, in heart or, uh, or cancer. Um, and you can see that the program has become very, is very sensitive to economic conditions. If I put up a figure like this for the food stamp program or unemployment insurance enrollment, one wouldn't necessarily be surprised, but it, is, it was surprising to me. I remember when I uh, uh, first started studying this many years ago, how strongly the, ec the state of the economy uh, affects this program. So uh, the, it is not the case that the, uh, the growth, as, as some of the, these figures go some way towards suggesting, uh, it is not the case that the growth of SSDI is just due to aging and the fraction insured. There was recently a blog post on the Washington Post arguing that that was the case, but in fact, and, and so you can look this up by uh, Brad Plumer, but in fact the demographics and the change in the fraction of women insured explain less than 40% of SSDI growth. So the bigger change, so if you look here, you break it up by, uh, for both men and for women and ask, well, what's been driving the growth in enrollment? Take, let's look at the middle bar. That's everyone. Okay? And so the, the bar at the, at the bottom is eligibility. What fraction of people are insured for the program? Okay? And that's contributing about 0.4% of the 2.7% increase. The population aging, that's contributing about 0.6%. So the rest, the 1.6 one, the 1. remaining, the vast, the, the majority of the growth is driven in changes in the likelihood for, very, for holding fixed the characteristics of the person. You can take any start year you want. You can take 1985, 1980, 1990, whatever, 1989 to 2011 um, uh, are the years here. But you can see the fraction explained by each of these things, the age-specific increases are 60% uh, uh, of this. Um, similarly, this is taken from, now this is not that inconsistent with the slide that um, uh, Steve presented uh, at, an, er, at a recent uh, meeting of the Social Security Advisory Board. This is just taken, cut and pasted from his slide deck uh, on March 8, 2013. 
And basically here, he sort of points out that there has been this big increase in, you know, after you control for the age and the insured, this big increase in the age-adjusted prevalence, which is attributable to higher award rates among women, more people getting on uh, who are younger, and much lower mortality rates among people who are on SSDI. So an award, the likelihood that a person made an award today is going to still be receiving benefits uh, years in the future is much higher than it used to be. And probably because of that, the present value associated with an SSDI award is increasing as well. David Otter and I in our research have estimated that the present value of an SSDI award, if you account for both the SSDI cash and the Medicare benefits, is close to $300,000. Uh, so it's a, it's, you know, and that's partly because the duration has been going up so much. Um, the second thing that I want to talk briefly about is that we're following a path foreseen by OACT. And I think here I'm going to point to some recent research done by Mary Daly and co-authors at the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of San Francisco. And you can see, so we'll probably hear from Steve today, and you know, it's hard. I mean, doing projections is hard business. It's not like one sh I would expect anyone to like hit the nail on the head um, every time with projections. But in general, SSA, the Office of the Actuary, has tended to understate, uh, underpredict the growth in the program. So 1996 is the one exception. But if you look in, and these are basically from the Mary Daly study, this as you can see in the handout, this is taken from OACT's short range actuarial projections of the program, all available uh, years. So you can see the 2010 projection, you can see there's a projection that things are really gonna flatten out. So SSDI enrollment grew from about 5 million from 1992 to 2012, and the projection is that over the next 20 years it's gonna grow by about one tenth that amount. And I think it's gonna slow down, but not nearly that much. And as a result, SSDI expenditures are gonna go, grow more rapidly, Medicare expenditures are gonna grow more rapidly, than uh, projected. Um, and so here, I think it is you know, sort of useful to, I, I, I think that it's useful to point out that it is very likely, given the past research and what you can see here from this figure, that uh, the Office of the Actuary is again projecting, under projecting future program growth. And you know, once again, nothing, no, I, I don't expect any uh, projections to be perfect, but I think if we're trying to have 2020 vision on this program, what's coming down the pike, the program to a first order approximation has been on autopilot for 30 years. It uh, hasn't really changed much, despite you know, many changes in other government programs, and this one hasn't at all. And so here you can see this is just the uh, OACT projections uh, more specifically. And if you are interested, this is more uh, work from the Mary Daly report, but you can see our, our technical panel in 2011, we had a number of recommendations that would tend to increase the, what, the number of projected people on SSDI. So thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here, and I look forward to listening to Steve. Good. Good example to follow of being right on time. Um, and uh, the second uh, presenter in this session is, is going to be Steve Goss, who's the Chief Actuary of the Social Security Administration. Steve, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Ron. Uh, I guess uh, I should probably start by saying it's interesting that myth and fact are both four-letter words. But anyway, let me, let me try a few facts. Uh, Let's see, we have a uh, right left here. I guess my time starts when I can get to my slides. Where, where do I? Oh, no. Can you tell me how to get to my slides? Jason. Jason? Yeah. I'd use more of uh, Mark's. Boy, unfortunately, this comes off your time sheet, so. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> Another myth, right, okay. Uh, is this? Yeah, we still have Wharton slides here. Is there a way to get to mine? There's more Mark Duggan. Okay. Okay. Well, I could kind of talk for Mark slides, but I didn't. I didn't prepare for that. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, here we go. Okay. Very good. Well, let me start with the first one. Uh, as, uh, as Mark indicated, we uh, were presented with a couple of hypotheses, uh, one of which is federal disability trajectory cannot be sustained. 
Well, it not only cannot be, but it will not be. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty clear in, in, in the projections we're making. And if you just look at the basics and the essentials of why cost has grown and why anybody would expect it to be growing in the future, uh, it's going to flatten naturally. Uh, and we've understood these, uh, these tendencies and have been projecting uh, this kind of pattern for, for literally decades now. Uh, I've been studying this uh, process for a little while, too. Uh, fundamental restructuring, uh, eligibility of disability service program. Uh, is required to avoid fund exhaustion. Uh, fundamental restructuring and reform, uh, really not so much. Obviously, the tax rate is too low by about 0.4% of payroll to cover the scheduled costs under the DI program. Uh, I would say that's not necessarily an unsustainable, uh, unworkable situation. We need to either find a way to reduce the cost of the program or increase the, uh, the amount of money coming into it, which we'll get into a more in a little while. Let me just share with you sort of uh, the trajectory. Mark is exactly right. Nobody has a real crystal ball. Nobody can really project. And back in 1996, which we actually do pay some attention to, because that was after the last time that there was actually congressional action on changing the DI program, a reallocation of the tax rates. We, have, we made a projection that the trust funds in the black line here, uh, as a percentage of annual cost of the program, would rise up because of the tax rate reallocation, and then would dip down and would become depleted in the year 2016. Well, a, a wonderful thing happened between 1995 and 2005. Who remembers the words new economy? Okay, nobody remembers new economy? My gosh, you all are kind of forgetful. When new economy happened, we had this surge of, of wonderful stuff. Employment was way up, unemployment was down, our trustees, like everybody else, took this to heart and were hoping it would continue, continue. Moore's Law was going to be on steroids, all kinds of good stuff. And as a result, we were projecting even higher trust fund levels and that the trust funds would extend out further. Now you can argue we were being, uh, you know, irrationally exuberant at the time, but this is pretty much the general sense of where the economy is going. Maybe not at Wharton, I don't know, but, uh, but, but anyway, this, this is where things had gone through about the 2008 trustees report. And then another funny thing happened, which is a recession hit us. And with a, with a recession, it sort of what I would call back to reality. And uh, by the uh, 2012 trustees report, our most recent, we've come back to basically the starting point where we were at 1996 trustees report, and we're back to a 2016. So we went through the period of irrational exuberance. The trustees were hopeful, wishful that, yes, things would be going great in the economy, and they were not so much. But let me go a little bit to something else about predictability here. At the uh, advisory board discussion that Mark discussed a couple weeks ago, there were at least three people who talked about the fact that Social Security's disability insurance costs had risen from 10 to 20 percent of overall Social Security costs over some past period. Well, you know, I just looked at 1980 and 2010, and 1980 it was not 10, but 12.8 percent of total Social Security costs. And we were projecting back in 1996 at the tax rate reallocation that it would rise to 16.9 percent of Social Security costs by 2010. It actually made it to 17.9, but again, something we failed to predict happened, which was the recession which increased the number of people on our rolls by about 5%. And 5% will take you from about 16.9 to about 17.9. So, so we missed guessing the recession. Now, we did project back in 1996, as we do now, that we're going to drop back down to about 12.5% of total program costs for Social Security. And I would suggest, uh, given the track record of how, we d how well we did back in 1996, projecting the percentage for 2010, we might have a shot at doing not too bad uh, for, for the future projection. Now let's go to the slide that Mark already sort of took advantage of. Uh, and one of the things we'd heard, Mark is now looking, I guess, 1989 to 2011. Prior to that, we'd been hearing a lot about uh, a tripling of the number of people on the disability rolls, which is really a 187% increase. That's roughly a tripling uh, between 1980 and 2010. Uh, well, 41% increase occurred just because of the size of the overall population increased. There is additional shift of the population from younger ages to older ages during that period, which also shifted the number of people receiving disability, because people 45 and over received disability with a much higher probability than people under that. There was, as Mark also indicated, there was a big shift up in insured rates, especially for women. We show a small number here, really, because there was also another change happening fundamentally in our population, the number of people who don't get insured because they don't have reported earnings because they're in the underground economy as uh, 
unauthorized uh, immigrants. Uh, and there is finally the 42%. We broke this down a little bit. The 42%, you've got to keep in mind, going from 1980 to uh, 2010, and I, I would suggest it's exactly the same thing from 1989 to 2011. The, the starting points, either 1980 or 1989, were points that followed right after we'd gone through a really strong economy, which is good for disability in a lot of ways. Uh, 2010 is a period right where we've just gone through a really bad recession. So we're going from the worst of times or the best of times to the worst of the times actually in looking at these increases, uh, that the, the recession alone that we have this time actually resulted in a boost of about 5% in the number of disabled workers. Uh, on top of that, we have about another 4% increase in 2010 because of the increase in the normal retirement age that uh, was not in existence. Now 66, people stay on disability until 66. Back in 1980 uh, and in 1989, they only stayed on until 65. Uh, as, uh, as we've all discussed, there has been an increase in female incidence rates. I don't think I'm going to have uh, time within nine minutes to sort of get into that in detail, but hopefully in the follow-up have some slides on that. Younger incidence, the incidence rates for, for people under 45 have risen from 20% as high as those for over 45 to 28% as high. Uh, there's been some shift, no question. And lower death rates have had an impact. But let me go to one that I wish we had a lot of time to talk about. This is really a breakdown, it's sort of a new slide of just our population dynamics. And what I think is fascinating about this, look at the period between 1970 and 1990. Now the thing to possibly focus on, well the thing we generally focused on in the past is the red line here, which is the share of the adult population, 25 and over say, that is gonna be working age versus aged. And you can see between 2010 and 2030, this is the big story about the baby boomers and why social security and retirement costs are gonna be going up so much in the future. This is the big story we've told to date. But the green line and the difference between the green and, oh, here it's green and purple lines, the difference between them is really important. You can see between 1970 and 1990, the distance between those two really shrank. Keep that in mind. That was because the baby boomers were doing what? They were entering the workforce at young ages where not so many people get disabled. But then between 1990, roughly 1989, and 2010, roughly 2011, uh, look at what happened to the, to the population between 45 and 64. It just increased dramatically. So that anybody who ever looks at the ratio of disabled worker beneficiaries to the total population age 25 to 64 is gonna be really kind of highly misled by, by the dynamics of these. And then of course we see how this plays through in the future. We've gotten to 2010 and you can see the distance between the green and the purple lines. Well, if anything, it shrinks a little bit as we go to 2030. This is just population. This is, you know, facts. There's not a lot we can really do about that going forward in the future. Uh, I won't really spend a lot of time on this, but this really just shows you what has happened to the projection, well, to the fact of the number of workers per disabled worker beneficiary. It went up. Uh, the workers per beneficiary back when the boomers were ascending into 25 to 44, and now it's gone down as they've moved up into the higher ages, up to 45 to 64, where disability happens more often. And in the future, uh, that, uh, that relationship will stay pretty much fixed. Uh, you can see this also on the slide where we have DI cost as percentage of GDP. Uh, kind of a fortuitous pick, I guess, to pick 1989 as your starting point running up to 2011. 1989 was a really, really, again, the best of times because that's a time when the boomers had just gotten into the youngest working ages and have really helped out in, in terms of lowering the cost. By 2010, 2011, 2012, we not only have the boomers right now at prime disability ages to push up the cost as percentage of GDP, but in addition, there's about a 4% uh, increase in the cost as percentage of GDP, GDP as a result of the recession. Why? Well, as it happens, this is really kind of interesting. When we compare our 2008 versus our 2012 trustees report projections, 2008, we, we assumed no recession. 2012, we knew there was a recession and we reflected it. Again, not prescient. So, but you can see how much we had about a two to four percent increase in the number of disabled worker beneficiaries, but the reduction in the number of workers expected in the economy and GDP itself was about 10 percent, resulting in overall 14. Mm -hmm. You can also look at this at the reduction in the number of workers relative to what we've been projecting versus the increase in the number of disabled worker beneficiaries. So we had a big, big drop in the number of workers from what had been expected. Uh, a little bit of those became disabled worker benefits. Uh, they, they didn't all come out of the DI roles, obviously. And finally, I guess I'd just like to wrap, sorry. <laughs> Is that not wrap? Okay, wrap, wrap it up.
got it, wrap it up. Okay, so the bottom line is, is the sky falling? Is the program out of control? No. Are we following a path per scene? I would say fact, yes. Not sure about the myth part. Uh, and what we're really facing fundamentally here is a program that has a cost in the future of about 0.8% of GDP, a, a revenue scheduled under law that's about 0 0.63, 0 0.65% of GDP. We've got a gap to fix one way or the other. Uh, there are lots of ways approaching that. The few folks who sit in this room much of the time, not today, uh, will be making those decisions, uh, and we look forward to seeing how they want to go because we'll be doing estimates for it. Thanks very much. Stay up here. All right, so now according to the uh, arrangement that we have, we're going to have an uh, opportunity for each side to rebut. Uh, and so we're going to start with Mark. You have three minutes to say whatever you want to uh, about what uh, Steve said, and then it will be Steve's turn. I, try to, I won't bother to try to get the slides. Three minutes is not, not a lot. Um, so I, uh, I'm, I enjoyed Steve's presentation. I think uh, this program, I, I agree with some of what he said, obviously not all of it. Um, I think the, the, atten the, things, the sort of things that I would draw attention to on uh, the slide deck that I sent around, if you look on the second page, the, the age group growth in DI enrollment, if you look, you know, once again, I sort of pointed out the outset, aging has contributed. The increase in the fraction of women insured for DI has contributed. But even if you control for that, if you drill down and you look at how likely people are to be on SSDI, on the SSDI program, it's grown enormously. The chance that a person, let's say, in their early 50s, so we're, aging isn't going on there. We're looking, we're telescoping in on a group that they're, they're, they're in their early 50s is receiving SSDI benefits has, uh, has doubled. Is there any, do you think, is it, you think it would be possible to get up the slides that I had before? Um, and so it is true that the growth in, uh, in the, the changing uh, age structure and the increase in the fraction of women insured has been a contributor, but a much bigger contributor have been sort of these other factors that I talked about the increase in uh, uh, basically age-specific, DI-insured specific rates. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Economic downturns lead to a huge increase in program enrollment. The medical eligibility criteria, ha the sort of word of mouth of the, that those have changed somewhat has led to a big change in the characteristics of people who are becoming covered for the program. The declining generosity of retired worker benefits has caused many people to say, actually, if I claim early, retirement benefits. I can do 30, get 33% more if I instead apply for disability, and that right now is on track to go to 43% uh, greater. And you know, there are a number of reasons that, uh, that have uh, contributed to this growth, and I think you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, the country has had a, really it's when the wind at its backs in the sense of some structural features, the aging of the baby boom population as they aged into their peak earnings years, the growth in the fraction of women who are working uh, has both of those have been powerful contributors to GDP growth. Right now, those things are changing. One of them, the latter one is plateaued, the other one is going in reverse, reverse. And I sincerely believe that policymakers now have to start doing better and better and better going forward to get that kind of same, uh, to enjoy that kind of same economic growth to which we've been accustomed going forward over the next 20 years. And I think SSDI, it's a program that's been on autopilot for 30 years. And I think there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from what's happened with other with experimenting with other programs. There are no easy fixes here. There's no silver bullets. It's hard choices. There are trade-offs. It's an extremely important program. It provides benefits to some of the nation's most vulnerable people. And I think you know the the sort of uh, the view that I think David Otter and I both have in the proposal that we've put out is to mend the program and and not end it. But you know it the, the a lot of the stuff that Steve had pointed to was looking at growth in the numbers on receiving benefits. Here you can see this is it, the the, I want to sort of, I try to focus on what is the control, ignore all those other, get control for all those other factors, and you can see that there really has been this, the, the program is dramatically different now than uh, it was just 20 years ago. And, you know, these increases that have been steadily going up, why are they going to stop? Okay? Is it, you know, it is, uh, I think that it, it is, uh, I'm, they have been occurring. And it is uh, for the reasons that uh, David and I and others have outlined in our research, it is very likely they will continue. I think SSDI will grow more slowly, a little more, somewhat more slowly in the years ahead, but it is not going to become flat. And this is as a proportion of the population. So I think policymakers really have, it is I, an obligation both to the nation's taxpayers and especially to the SSDI recipients to improve this program and start talking about it. 
get it on the, uh, the radar screen, because I think as a nation we can do so much better with this program given the experience of uh, uh, recent years for, for other programs. So thanks again Steve. so much. Wonderful. Great. Let me just uh, address for one moment, I think, uh, one slide that Mark had here. You know, you really have to be careful with numbers. Uh, on these slides, and Mark and I talked about this before, these are the percentage of disability recipients per total population, uh, which does ignore the insured rates uh, and, and many other things. It's a little bit like if, if we were talking to MetLife and we said, you know, uh, the percentage of people that are getting death claims from life insurance claims in, in MetLife doubled last year. But, you know, four years ago, we sold twice as many life insurance policies. So insured rates really, really matter. I don't know if we could get back to my slide deck to, because to, I had a few more slides that would be really, really useful to get into there. Uh, it, is, uh, it, I guess the, oh, we'll get back to the very beginning. Okay. So here is, here's a picture, so we're talking about the insured. Here shows you the magnitude of what's happened with the insured. Back in 1970, even 1980, uh, look at the percentage of the population of women uh, at age, what, 20 to 64 here. That was, in fact, insured for disability benefits. This is huge. This is not just a little bitty effect. Uh, uh, the recession had an effect. Here is also a look at what's happened at the relative incidence rates. This is something, when we talk about incidence rates going up, the gap back in 1980, even 1989, between men and women was really huge. If you look at the ratio between those, women's disability incidence rates were way below men's. Now, I wish we understood exactly why, and ladies, sorry, but, but you know, they've basically gotten together now. Is that because of the increased percentage of women who are now insured, they're more likely to become disabled? Is it because of higher stress jobs? Hard to say, but it's a fact, and that's what's happened. We don't project that women are going to cross over and that these trends are going to keep on going. We think that would be a little silly. Could it happen? Anything is possible. Uh, here's a little graph. Won't really talk a lot about this because we don't have time. It's almost wrap time, I'm sure. Uh, but, but you can see how, how recessions have had huge effects. The recessions where we have in the red line is the civilian unemployment rate. We've had a pretty big spike recently, and it stayed up there for a while. It has not had a dramatic effect on our disability incidence rate. Uh, and uh, if you look over the long-term trajectory, the disability incidence rate, oh, and by the way, this is number of people starting to get disability divided by the number of people who are insured, not the people who are in the population, which you really have to look at if you want to look at this. Here is what's happened in terms of death rates. Of course, they've been going down like death rates throughout our whole population. Our, our recovery rates for medical recovery and for work recovery stayed at about 1%. We have a really, really strict definition of disability. When people get on, they're usually very disabled. They can't do any work. So we don't expect really a whole lot of recovery. There's one thing I just wanted to sort of get at here, and uh, you know, a lot of times people talk about the increase in mental impairments, the increase in cardiovascular or, or decrease in cardiovascular. Here's a look at female new awards for disability insurance benefits at ages 30 to 39, relatively young for, 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 for disability awards. And look at this. The blue is the percentage, gives you the percentage of the disability awards across all this time from 1982, but you can go to 1989 if you want, uh, all the way out to about 2010, 2011, and you can see the percentage that were coming on the rolls with a primary diagnosis, mental impairment. Changed? No? Uh-uh. Pretty much the same. Uh, for uh, males, there's, of course, there's the HIV deal in there, which, which complicates things. But now let's look at the older ages, and here we have, let's, let's take males. For males, yes, the purple band, well, metal, that's staying very stable once again on an age-by-age -age basis. Uh, the purple band is the musculoskeletal. That has gone up, but at the same time, circulatory as a share, does not say it's stable. I think that's actually diminished quite a bit. So we've had almost like a swap out of less people coming on for circulatory. We probably understand a lot of why statins and all kinds of other good stuff and more musculoskeletal, something to be researched more, but it's not all about mental, it's not all about just a big increase uh, in, in, in the musculoskeletal, because at the same time we had a big decrease in circulatory. Uh, so I guess I would just wrap by saying, uh, I think we do understand what has been going on. I think we have a pretty good fix on what's going on forward, and, and we really are essentially at the peak, at the apex of virtually all of the factors that have been causing the disability insurance program to grow. Why don't you stay right here? So you each have one okay. minute. Go ahead. You can use that mic right there, I think, would be okay. okay. Yeah. Or do you want to be here, Mark? No, no. Okay. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm good right here. So uh, I guess that's the other side. Yeah. Here, this, so, this, Mark, come on. Yeah. This, come on, come, come on, bud. So, this one's uh, working. This is, yeah, it's good. It's good to be up here with you. I was um, a regretted pen, so yeah, we have some <laughs>
Um, so I think the, uh, I just want to you know, draw back your attention to the numbers that I showed earlier. And I think the, the likelihood uh, that, the, yes, aging has contributed. Yes, there's been an increase in the fraction DI insured. But that is not what's driving the growth in this program. And that is not what's going to continue to grow it going forward. The likelihood that a specific person controlling for those characteristics has come on this program has changed dramatically. And along with that, there's been a shift from objective conditions like circulatory, can heart attack, stroke, cancer, to more subjective conditions. And, somewhat, and that's, I think, a challenge for this program. We've got many, 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 many more people coming onto the program with harder to evaluate conditions. And that's not to say that everyone who has back pain and everyone who has a mental disorder, I'm hurting rap, wow, uh, is, uh, is, but just I think it is, uh, there, there needs to be more attention paid to that, and that's been associated with an increase in, uh, in the duration of the time uh, spent on the program. So I think, okay, great. Okay, I would just suggest that uh, I think we're, we're both saying a lot of things that are true. I think care and caution in understanding what is really going on here is really important and paying attention to the facts. Uh, there's no question that musculoskeletal has been increasing at higher ages, just as circulatory has been dropping. Mental, if you look across all the ages combined, mental may be appearing to be going up, but that's because the number of awards at younger ages has been going up. Is this because the younger people in our population are lucky enough to have sort of fallen behind the average wage, and therefore they have higher, uh, higher you know, higher disability benefits relative to their earnings. Actually, I would think that's something that we need to address under separate cover than, uh, than under, under the disability insurance program. If you just simply look at what has happened, uh, the aging of the population is huge. And I, I'm so glad that Kim Hildred got us started on this back in December 2011 for a hearing in this room with the, with the subcommittee and, uh, and has followed up with another one since and that, and that this is sort of continuing the flow because for me and my office, and I've been studying this for a few decades, uh, it really has been uh, a big eye-opener to look into the real drivers of disability and, and get much greater acuity on them. So I think this has been a very, very healthy process. And thanks for kicking off, us off, Kim. You're not done yet. Yeah. You're not. Have a seat oh, right up here. Stay right up here. Okay. okay do, we, is, do we have this mic now that's going to work? Oh, okay. Uh, well, it's going to be a little cumbersome. So you guys can yell, okay? So now Dan Mitchell from Cato. Uh, is going to ask dirty questions of these two first speakers, and we're, we have a way to judge to make sure the questions are equally dirty for both of them. So, Dan Mitchell, thank you for All right, well, I was also told that one of my jobs is to point to people in the audience who have questions, so I only have one or two questions in my mind, so be ready to raise your hand. The first thing I want to ask both speakers, is there any country or countries out there who you think have an ideal disability uh, system or countries that have made reforms that you think are worth looking at? Or, and, and feel, I guess, you know, if, if do we, we're fine on noise. Are we recording? Can, can people in back here if he just talks? And, and we're not recording, so people can just talk from there. Okay. Oh, 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 wait. Well, actually, if y'all can just come out of, we can all stand up here. So, yeah, we, I'm happy to, we can, we can share. Uh, so I think uh, there's been interesting research you're going to be hearing later uh, today from uh, Richard Burkhauser. And he and his uh, co-authors, like Mary Daly and others, have done some really interesting work looking at what's happening uh, in the Netherlands. They have moved to a system in which uh, uh, private uh, insurance markets are somewhat more involved. And in, uh, and I think he, are you going to be talking about this somewhat later today? Uh, but they have been basically, uh, you know, for a long time, they were sort of uh, uh, that so far above the U.S. in terms of their disability enrollment. But their enrollment has been declining, declining. Um, and I'm not an expert on the, on, the, uh, on the program there, but it's basically sort of been designed to kind of mimic somewhat uh, how workers' compensation in the U.S. works to give employers more uh, powerful incentives uh, uh, to keep this on their radar screen, um, uh, this program on their radar screen, rather than having it simply through uh, the Social Security Administration. I think the, what's happening in the Netherlands uh, uh, is uh, suggestive, and it's very similar to uh, what David Otter and I proposed in our, our, in our own uh, reform proposal for SSDI. Well, Mark, thanks for setting up uh, the Netherlands. I mean, uh, quite a long time ago, I'm sure Dorcas remembers, the, we, we had the situation in the Netherlands where it really was an unemployment insurance program. They, they had a really, really weak definition of disability. All you had to do is stop working and say, I want the benefit, and, and you got it. 
That is not what we have in this country. It's not what we've had since 1956 under the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. We have, in fact, compared to other countries, I don't think there is another country anywhere that has as strict a definition of disability as we have. It, it simply is a fact, uh, not a myth. It's really a fact. Uh, and so where do we go from here? We've done some work for Senator Coburn over on the other side of the Capitol on some possibilities. I think Rich Burkhauser and others have put forth a number of very interesting ideas. We're going to be working with them. We're certainly going to be working with with Kim and Catherine and all the people that work in this room and on the other side to try to develop uh, options. Uh, systems not out of control. Compared to other countries, we really, we're really in the best of all positions, uh, as far as I can tell, as compared to other countries with our disability insurance program. Uh, you, just, you just look at the drivers that have gotten us to where we are and the fact that they are basically spent in terms of moving us forward to higher cost. 0.8% of GDP isn't nothing. That's significant. So we have to, we have to determine how we deal with that and what we do about it. Okay, we apparently now have a working microphone. Uh, do we have questions out there or we're going to leave it up to me? We have a question in the back. Uh, I guess, do we need to bring the microphone back there? Can you hear me? Yeah. But he, okay. yeah. You, don't need to. you can repeat the question. Yes. Ask the question, okay. make it brief. Okay. You say you are conditioned part of your evaluation of auto pilots, but haven't there been specific pinpoints of added significant costs like the regulations that add disability coverage to Americans with disabilities act and the two million grant funds to low there? Okay, the question is about whether uh, changes like the Americans with Disabilities Act and welfare reform, what role they have played. years was in the mid-1980s that basically expanded the definition of disability so that uh, more individuals with somewhat more uh, subjective conditions, mental disorders, back pain, and so forth could qualify. I'm not saying that policy is wrong. I'm just saying that that had a powerful effect. On the, I don't think it's working at all. It's but it, it, it is, okay. It had a powerful effect on the composition mm -hmm. of uh, who was receiving benefits. We're talking today about SSDI. I do think there are a lot of connections between uh, welfare uh, uh, programs and SSI. I've actually done some work on the SSI program, so I think there's some links here. I think the spillovers of that program to the SSDI program are actually somewhat much smaller, uh, but I think you know they, they, they probably do exist somewhat. But I think when thinking about the SSDI program as a whole, the sort of fiscal impact of the program, <coughs> I think it's important to remember, so 2012 expenditures on the program were $140 billion. Expen S Medicare expenditures for SSDI recipients were about 90 to $100 billion. We don't have up-to-the-minute data from CMS, and you know, to the extent that the program affects labor supply, and there's a lot of evidence that it does, uh, enrollment growth ha has coincided with a reduction in tax revenue below what it otherwise would be. So when thinking about the fiscal impact of the program, I think it's important to bear in mind not just the cash benefits, not just the Medicare, but also the potential effects on people's uh, uh, labor supply. And, you know, just like with welfare reform, there's no simple answers, there's <coughs> difficult trade-offs to make, and I think if, 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 if it is the case that policymakers really decide to take this on and try to uh, uh, make some reforms to the program that are going to both improve the economic well-being of people with disabilities while simultaneously getting the program fiscally on a better trajectory. I think you know it's going to there are going to be some difficult decisions, but I think it I think the the nation's uh, uh, pe people with disabilities in the country deserve it, and I think taxpayers deserve it too. Yeah. It's working. Uh, all interesting points. Let me just mention though that. Uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the unemployment rates, what we've had happen recently, we've had a big surge. There's no question about that. Uh, will that continue to be? Uh, I'm trying to, so, so what was your question again? Well, the, the question was about uh, ADA and welfare reform oh, okay. and the implications. I, w I wish we had our most colorful little graph up there that showed back from, what, 1972 all the way out, all the bumps on unemployment rate, and we also indicated various kinds of things. One of the biggest things that affected the incidence rates, if you look at that in your handouts, I forget what slide number it is, is back around 1980, SSI had just uh, come around, and we had a big outreach for SSI to try to find people who would be coming on SSI disability. Well, as it turns out, we have a lot of people who get SSI disability and Social Security DI disability. And that outreach resulted in a real surge of people coming on the rolls right after around 1980, which started to push up our prevalence rates. Now, is that a bad thing? Were there a lot of people who were actually being underserved in our population? Remember, in order to get a disability benefit, you have to be disabled, you have to be insured, and you have to know to apply. So with that kind of an outreach, that really made a big difference after 1980. It was really a level shift. Bad thing? I don't know. Maybe. It did increase cost. We've had a number of other things that have happened in the meantime throughout that period. 
Uh, Mark mentioned the multiple impairments. We also had the drug addiction and alcoholism, which was taken out as being a singular reason for coming to disability. That had a big downward push. There have been a number of things gone, gone back and forth. We, we had the institution of uh, continuing disability reviews. We've been a little bit back and forth about how much we fund that, of course. Uh, but there, there have been a number of different policy changes over time. The net effect of all of those, not entirely clear. I would just go back to, if you just look at the facts, uh, the rise in the population, 41 or 2 percent, whatever it is, the aging of the population, which moved from 1989, where the boomers were all in the workforce, all at the youngest ages, contributing very, very few of them uh, uh, at disability ages, to 2011 or 2010. They've all moved up precisely to the highest disability incidence ages. So of course we've seen a big shift. Okay, question back there. Yeah, we have a question on recovery rates. So I think part of that, or I, part of that was the alcohol and drug addiction that a yeah. lot of people were tossed off the program in 1996 yeah. and 1997. So you saw this big increase. It's definitely true, though. Continuing disability reviews lead to higher exit rates from the program. Basically, when you check in on people in person to see are you still disabled, uh, unable to engage in substantial gainful activity, those um, do are powerfully associated with uh, uh, with exit rates from the program. One other thing I would just want to throw out that I, hasn't come up at all today, but um, is the role of the sort of appeals process. So it is the case now that almost uh, more than 40% of SSDI recipients are rejected once and then twice by SSA and then by the disability examiners, and then they go to the administrative law judges. And there's been some really interesting work, and I don't know if it's going to get talked about today, about uh, that process and about now almost 75% uh, of those decisions that go before ALJs the ALJ ends up overturning the two previous decisions by uh, the so by the disability examiners. Um, and so it is about 75, it depends, it's between 71% and 79, I see some people, some faces. It's 71 or so, you can look at the S SSA's annual statistical supplement on the uh, Social Security Disability Insurance Program. But the role of uh, ALJs in this process, I think, is an important one, because there's been, there's been pretty powerful evidence that there's a lot of heterogeneity across ALJs some making awards in about 100% of cases and others in vastly, vastly lower. Uh, uh, and so I think that's something that... Okay, okay let's, let's try a fact. Uh, fact is that uh, just a very few years ago, it is true that the percentage of cases that were denied twice, in some cases only once, and in a good part of the country that are under our prototype but don't have a reconsideration, 60% uh, were overturned by LJs. That number in the very recent years has dropped down below 50%. I don't, I'm not really sure where 71% comes from. It dropped from 60% down to 48% are, are the most recent numbers. Part of this is because of the recession. Uh, not, and part of it also is because the time between when people get their double no, or sometimes their single no, until they're considered at the LJ, less time passes. The more time that passes between you're told no at the reconsideration and when you go to the administrative law judge, the more time there is for a condition, which people tend to get at higher age, to potentially deteriorate and therefore a greater probability of overturn. So I, I think we, we, we have to be careful about that. And I, again, I'm forgetting what the, what the earlier point was, but there was uh, a, a lot to Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Y'all are off duty. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we have final. And now we have final comments from Kathy Ruffing, who's a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and from Roger Mahan, who's a policy advisor to the House Majority Leader Cantor. So, Kathy, thank you so much for coming. Good morning, I appreciate the invitation to be here today. I uh, know I have only a few minutes, so I will talk fast and use very short words. Okay, good, good, good. I very much appreciate the compliment that Mark Duggan paid to me by using our slide, which had also been appeared in the Washington Post. Um, 
As Steve Gosh remarked, you have to be very careful when using numbers about the disability program. In a lot of the media stories, you see raw numbers of people on the roll. The, the program is skyrocketing, it's out of control, it's in crisis. And at first blush, that does appear to be correct. The number of people on the roll has tripled since 1980, and it has doubled since 1995. But that is a very distorted way to look at the program. First of all, the number of people is not relevant. You have to divide by population. Then you have to divide by insured population. Then you have to adjust for the aging of the population. Uh, but when you do all of those things, you find that a properly age and sex adjusted disability receipt rate has risen only very gradually from about 3.1% in 1980 to 3.5% in 1995 to 4.5% now. But what that means is that extra growth since 1995 is about one third of the total growth. We and other defenders of the program have never maintained that demographic factors account for all of the growth in disability, <coughs> only that they account for most of it. And so please be very careful about that exaggeration. Uh, but, mm -hmm. um, Mark also discussed the, um, the uh, alleged biases and errors in the actuaries, uh, consistent underestimates of the disability program. I do not have a copy of this graph in front of me, but I believe that the most, uh, the most egregious looking underestimates were from back in the early 1980s. Well, this was before the passage of the Disability Benefits Reform Act of 1984. The law changed. It is not relevant to look at projections that were made at that time. I might also add that the law was enacted unanimously in both the House and the Senate. Uh, but you may criticize its provisions as arguably too subjective or too liberal. I, I happen not to agree. But the very fact that some, some disabilities are not visible and are difficult to evaluate doesn't mean that they are not disabling. Okay. Um, a third uh, criticism that I have of um, Mark's presentation is that he, and like many other people, um, shows that the recent economic downturn has caused a surge in applications to the DI program, which is correct. Many such analyses, however, fail to show that the, uh, that the resulting increase in awards is far more modest. The evidence tends to show that in an economic downturn, a lot of marginal people apply to the disability program, understandably, in desperation. Um, they are more likely to be denied. What we find when we look at the country in cross-section is a very clear geographic pattern of disability and one that is readily explainable. You find uh, that disability rates are higher in states that have low rates of high school completion, that have a higher median age, that have fewer immigrants, and that have a blue-collar industry mix. What we conclude is that the program is working pretty much as it was intended to do, that it is sustainable with a modest reallocation of tax rates between the programs. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, can I take some During questions, okay? Let's we'll just be a fraction of people's minds, which is great. Uh, well, we, uh, we're not going to depart from the schedule, I'm sorry. Roger Mahan, uh, who works for Mr. Cantor. Okay. Um, trying to keep all of the papers straight here. Uh, one of the uh, hazards of remaining in these jobs for long periods of time and not doing things like Ron did and spending some time up here and getting the hell out of here is if you were around in 1996, the last time we did the reallocation uh, and projections were trust fund exhaustion is put forward until 2016, well, that's pretty good if you're in 1996. But if you stuck around and you're in 2013, it's a looming problem that we're going to have to address. And uh, basically, 
one of the things that we know is if we do nothing and we let trust fund exhaustion happen, then we're going to have a 20 percent across the board cut to benefits to absolutely everybody on this program from the most severely disabled person who is immobilized and can do nothing to the person with the kinds of disabilities that uh, some would argue are much more subjective uh, and who in a different policy environment might still be participating in the workforce uh, although perhaps not at the level that they might have participated in before their disabling condition arose. Uh, and I think one of the things um, that I've taken from some of these presentations is that um, we have really begun to see uh, the effects of longer term problems in our economy play out in this program. Uh, and, and I actually was fascinated and really appreciated Kathy's chart because what this is telling me is exactly what she was telling us that for populations in our economy with fewer skills, lower educational attainment, uh, and um, basically coming from the kinds of industries, blue collar industries, manufacturing, mining, those kinds of things, uh, when the economy turns south, uh, there are fewer opportunities for them to remain employed at the kinds of levels and at the types of jobs with incomes that they used to be able to receive before the economy harmed those activities. And I, I have to admit, when I first looked at this, I thought, this is a fascinating uh, distribution. And I showed it to a friend of mine who uh, came from the Energy and Commerce Committee and I said, does this look to you like the war on coal? And he said, yeah. So, I mean, if you have a population of blue-collar workers who are used to earning $70,000 a year uh, and federal uh, policy basically targets an industry uh, that uh, basically uh, has provided a level of employment there uh, and you obviously are going to be able to demonstrate that there have been some health effects by that kind of job, you're, you're probably going to end up uh, qualifying for this program. A uh, couple of things uh, in addition, because I see I'm running out of time. Um, the uh, fact that you uh, may have a easier time getting into this program if you have an easier gatekeeper should raise questions uh, for policymakers uh, on an issue of fairness, because uh, persons who take early retirement without a disabling condition suffer a reduction in, in the benefit because they have left the workforce earlier. Uh, but if you can demonstrate that you have a disabling condition and you take advantage of this program and you're leaving the workforce at an earlier rate, you're not suffering that penalty and it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be as high a proportion uh, of the ability to get into the program related on whether or not you had a gatekeeper who was m more or less stringent. Um, and I think uh, just uh, to wrap this up, we're going to have to necessarily take into consideration the degree to which we want to uh, refocus this program in a way that encourages incentives for people to uh, have an attachment to the workforce for a longer period of time because everything that we have ever learned, particularly from Ron when we were doing welfare reform, is employment leads to better outcomes, not only economically, but in terms of your health experiences, uh, in terms of how well your kids do. Uh, so to the extent that we have incentives in a program that cause people to leave the workforce earlier than they otherwise might, that's something we need to take into consideration. I'm, no, we just can't do it. I'm sorry. Because otherwise then the other side have to have a comment. So I'm supposed to summarize uh, to get us back on schedule. I'm going to do it in about 30 seconds. I was a congressional staffer for 14 years. Uh, and I sat here, as I often did, thinking about members, watching all these charts and listening to these two extremely intelligent uh, people who know this program very well, get into a debate of what the factors are, the role of recessions, uh, increased workforce participation, participation by women, the insurance rate, uh, by condition, aging of the society. The members are going to go nuts, and they're not going to be informed by this debate unless there can be more agreement on the facts and the charts and all that. 
In fact, if I were a staff director, I would try to figure out a way to get these two would be great candidates to present together and the first part of the presentation would be here is what we agree on. And then the second part would be here's where we differ and here's why we differ. That would be very helpful to the members. A discussion like the one we had here is going to, the members will go right out in the back room and in the old days they used to smoke. I guess they can't do that anymore. All right, so now we're going to move right into the next session. Uh, the, the hypothesis for the, uh, for the next session is disability approvals have expanded to enroll many individuals who are capable of working full-time or part-time in the private economy. Uh, and Richard Burkhauser from well, he's here from Australia, but he's normally at Cornell uh, in the econ economics department. Will make the first presentation, Richard. Okay, so uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, gunfight at the OK Corral among uh, green eye shade uh, folks. Uh, this is, uh, th this is a very important uh, issue, though, about uh, what's been happening, the growth in the system. And it's one that uh, has significant implications for what kind of efforts are going to have to be made to uh, uh, meet uh, the, uh, the looming 2016 uh, uh, issue with regard to uh, 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 the loss of funds or the, uh, the end of uh, the, the uh, trust fund. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to uh, summarize the debate that we heard here and then move it on to SSI and then talk about why these numbers are so critical to get a handle on. All right, so uh, to do that, uh, what uh, the hypothesis that I'm going to talk about is uh, disability approvals have expanded to, en to enroll many individuals who are capable of working full-time or part-time in the private economy. So the issue is, to what degree uh, are people who are coming onto the rolls, uh, marginal folks, who if given different kinds of incentives and different kinds of treatments, would have in fact been able to continue into the workforce. Uh, so uh, this, uh, my comments are really based on uh, a book that uh, Mary Daly and I did uh, uh, in, in 2011 for AEI, The Declining Work and Welfare of People with Disabilities, What Went Wrong, and uh, A Strategy for Change. And I think it's uh, going to be interesting that uh, uh, Mark Duggan, who uh, basically his research uh, was for a Brookings Institution uh, project to look at what was going on with disability in our book, uh, funded by AEI, come to remarkably similar conclusions about uh, what's uh, causing the growth in the program and even where uh, policy reforms uh, should go forward. Uh, so uh, 1990 is an important era for people who care about uh, people with disabilities. It's uh, the uh, passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Uh, this is a new vision of the rights and responsibilities of working age people with disabilities. And uh, the view was of uh, that act is that people with disabilities can and will work if given the opportunity. Uh, now there's something very important about that. That says that having a disability doesn't mean that you can't work. That's a, a you might think that's a contradiction in terms, but it isn't. It's the notion that uh, impairments occur, uh, and that's what we've been talking about with the incidence of the onset of a disability, but the, uh, the kinds of social environment that a person is in will affect the outcome of whether that person moves on to the disability roles or continues to work. So uh, what happened since 1990? The reality is uh, that there's been an increasing share of working age people with disabilities who are on the SSI uh, or SSDI programs that are not working. So what happened and is, and is change possible? Uh, so point is impairments are uh, the population with disabilities who, are, who come on to the roles is mutable. It can be affected by policy. That's a really critical point. Uh, and it's, it's what separates out uh, pr uh, things that are exogenous to program growth from things that are endogenous. That is that are the result of the particular policies that we have for treating people with disabilities. So uh, a couple of numbers uh, which are repeats of other numbers that you've seen. Uh, if you look at the first uh, column, work, uh, limits, uh, work limitation prevalence, there has been a little bit of a change in the number of people who say that they have an uh, impairment that affects their ability to work. In 1981, it was 7.9%, 1997.4, uh, 2012, 8.6. 
uh, not much of a change compared to what those people are doing with their time. In 1981, 26% of them uh, were employed in the previous week when they mentioned they had a disability. Only 34% of them were on the SSDI or SSI roles. In 1990, that is between 81 and 1990, uh, the employment rate of people with disabilities actually rose. So between 81 and 90, it went from 26% to 30%. Uh, and uh, DI and SSI receipt was stable among this population. But after 1990, we have a dramatic drop in the employment of, uh, of people, uh, a drop from 30 to 15%, 15 percentage points, and 15 percentage point increase in the number of people are coming onto the rolls. Why is that? What's driving that change? That's what this discussion is all about that we had this morning. Uh, there are exogenous factors, and these are the ones that the actuaries spend a lot of time on. The actuaries are very good at counting easy stuff. So they know how old people are. They know whether they're men and women. They, uh, they can get that and get that pretty right. Uh, so aging the population, clearly important, as Mark and Steve both say. Changes in retirement age matter. Entry of women into the labor force sufficient to gain SSDI coverage, clearly important. All of those things relatively easy to measure because they're immutable. You can't change the fact that you're aging. We know how old you are. You can't change your gender. Uh, and we know who's covered by the programs. Those things we can get pretty well. The issue is what else is going on. Well, when you look at uh, these things, and now I'm going to talk about uh, some numbers that, uh, that uh, Mark talked about. And these are new numbers that uh, Mary Daly just uh, did. And she does this using the Office of the Actuary numbers. So this is as close as you can get to an attempt by an outside group to replicate what's been going on with the Office of the Actuary. The Office of the Actu Actuary tells you what their projections are in terms of the number of people coming onto the rolls. And what she does is use a shift share analysis. This is what Mark is doing. And what this is a battle about is uh, what is uh, exogenous, what can we explain within a shift share framework, and what is uh, uh, involved in the uh, prevalence or incidence within the groups that are changing. So there's been an increase in the retirement age. And that, uh, Mary says, explains 9.1% of the 100% uh, change between 1980 and 2011. So that mattered. Uh, the aging of the population clearly mattered. That explains 17.9% of it. And here's a little bit, bit of a controversy. Uh, uh, Mary goes along with Steve and talks about part of the change in the uh, prevalence or incidence within age-adjusted um, uh, 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 numbers is a so-called catch-up rate. So in 1980, women had, uh, uh, well, there's two parts. Uh, SSDI eligibility, that is coverage, uh, that accounts for 16.5%. Then there's another 12.8%, which is called prevalence catch-up. And that is that in 1980, the uh, prevalence of women who were uh, covered for a DI was, was lower of them coming onto the rolls than it was for men. Mary uses that and says, OK, let's do catch-up. Let's assume that. Uh, Part of the uh, change in the uh, increase in coverage is that uh, women Im immediately catch up and have the same prevalence rates as men in 1980. When you do all that stuff, and this is what uh, this is the bottom line, all that those first three things, those are all exogenous to the program. There is still 30, uh, 43 percent in the residual that's explained not by changes in in the composition of things, but in the incidence rate. This is what. Uh, 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 Mark was talking about when he's talking about if you look at age uh, 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 blocks, every age group is increased their movement onto the rolls. It isn't confined to older people. All, all age groups have increased their prevalence onto the program. OK, so then you get what Mary does. What Mary does is take the blue line, which is the unadjusted increase in the uh, DI rolls. And clearly, this is caused by all of those factors. And what you see, the blue line has increased from about 2.5% to uh, uh, almost 5% uh, between these years. Uh, and the uh, projection for the uh, uh, Office of the Actuary is that this increase is going to end, and it's going to be relatively flat after that. Uh, the uh, gold line, or red line, uh, is actually uh, the actuary's estimates uh, assuming that you're controlling for all the things we've just talked about, those first three things. And this has been increasing also. This is the 42%. So uh, 
42% of the increase is through this change in the incidence and prevalence of these groups. All right, so Steve tells us we shouldn't worry. The worst is over. There's clear sailing from now on. Well, one thing that Steve can't change is history. This is the history of his projections since 1980. And we're not talking about early, earlier than that. And in 88, he was way under in terms of, this is the actual, this is the, the, the black line is, is the way things are in terms of the recipiency rate uh, where the base is the working age population. But Mary has just done it because Steve uh, said that, no, you should really use the coverage rate. She's done the same thing for the coverage rate, and you get the same result. So it's not an issue of the population, the denominator. It's the numerator. And the numerator is that Steve has uh, and his office have underestimated those numbers with their 81 projections. These are the 10-year projections. So this is real, and this is what's projected. The colored lines are what are projected. Uh, they got it wrong in 88, underestimated. They got it wrong in 91, underestimated. They got it, they overestimated in 96, at least for the 10-year projection. They underestimated it in 2001. If, it was, if they knew it was right in 96, why did they change it in 2001? This is not cost of the program. This is the number of people coming onto the program. This is what the Office of the Actuary is supposed to be about. And they underestimated in 2001, they underestimated in 2005. Do we really have confidence they got it right in 2010? I would argue I'm not as confident as Steve is. But that would be hard to be, have anyone who's confident as Steve was. Uh, <laughs> What you want to look at is the possibilities that can happen. Steve has given us a zero rate of increase. Mary suggests, why don't you just take the average increase over the period 1990 to 2012 as a possible rate. And what you see is a, continue, a continued increase, not at quite as a, a, a high a slope. But this is the issue. And projections about how much it's going to cost to uh, get the system in order depend on these underlying assumptions. That's why the green eyes shade boys matter so much and why it's so important to get a range of estimates so that you're aware of the potential problems that are unstated in uh, any estimates of costs that use the projections of the office of the actuary. They're dependent on this hope that uh, there won't be any increases. Okay, so why does this matter? It matters because in 2010, the office of the actuary, if you use their estimates, in 2019, 10 years out, uh, there will be a caseload of 9.5 million, and it'll cost 157 billion in that year. Uh, and these are all in 2010 dollars. Uh, if you look at uh, Mary's projection, which is uh, you take the average of the growth over that period, it's 11.3 million or 187 billion. Now, you know, uh, Dirksen said a billion here, a billion there, and it's a lot of money. Uh, a billion isn't that much anymore, but still it's $30 billion. That's a 20% difference here that we're talking about. That's why the green eye shade discussion matters and why you, you, you staff better get your representatives to understand why these underlying uh, causes matter. But it matters also in terms of uh, the SSI Disability uh, Disabled Children's Program. What you see here are uh, the kinds of things that you want to look at initially, and that is the uh, increases in expenditures. There's certainly been an increase in, ex in expenditures in this program. There's also been an increase in uh, recipients. But the same kind of debate is going on here. These are just raw numbers. What you want to do is have them with a denominator, which means the covered population. Well, in SSI, you're not covered by uh, working in the workforce. You're covered by being in a, a household uh, whose income is uh, below the uh, break-even point on the SSI program and you, you, you have to meet an income test and an asset test. Now, we were uh, uh, criticized by some groups because we uh, looked at this and looked at the change of between 1974 and uh, 2010 uh, with regard to the number of kids per thousand children. And when you do that, you get it, it went from about 2% uh, 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 well, it's, it's steady. It, starts to increase with the Zebley uh, 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 amendments and then continues outward. Uh, but you don't want to look at uh, per thousand children. You want to do uh, for covered children. We said, well, let's just look at, uh, if you look at the number of children who live in households that are in, in poverty, and when you do that, you get a much more uh, rapid increase uh, uh, from this graph in terms of the, of the uh, ratios of uh, uh, kids were potentially eligible. We were criticized by that and said, well, uh, people said that, well, uh, there are many people, uh, kids who are coming on the rolls whose parents are not uh, below poverty, they're, they're uh, somewhat higher. So we, we show you that between, uh, by changing the base, by increasing the number of people there to 125 to 250, 
uh, 150 to 200, you're certainly going to lower the ratio of the number of people, kids on the, on the rolls per the base. But the, the key point is that it doesn't matter what the base is, you see a very rapid rise. So there's a very interesting statement uh, made by uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, former heads of the uh, Social Security Administration that said that uh, you shouldn't worry too much about SSI kids' growth. It's, uh, it's, it, it's continually be below 4% of the population. Well, actually, that's what we get. It's 4% of the population in 2010. Uh, and it has continually been below 4%, but as early as 1989, before Zevely, it was only around 2.5%. Uh, uh, so there's been a, uh, excuse me, it's been one, uh, uh, around 2%. So it's increased from 2% to 4% over that period. So you, uh, you, have to, you have to worry about this rise in SSI as well as DI. So what's, what's going on? What's driving this? As I said, actually, when you look at the, when you look at the uh, actual uh, uh, norm than to one, it's an increase of, uh, by uh, uh, an order of four, no matter how you use this, this measure. Okay, so what's been driving things? Uh, part of the uh, 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 factors are exogenous, uh, but part of them are endogenous. Uh, what are the endogenous factors? Well, it could be that the severity of disability has been increasing over time. If that's happening, then, of course, that's, that's also exogenous. But what we know, and Andrew Houghtonville got me these numbers, what we know is there hasn't really been any change in the, uh, 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 those reporting fair or poor health uh, in, in any adult age groups over this period. Same is true with work limitations. There hasn't been much of a change. So what's going on? What are other explanations for this increase in the prevalence rates of uh, people coming onto the rules, uh, onto the rolls. And I'm going to talk about four of them, and that's what primarily I'm going to talk about now. Uh, there's changes in the SSDI, uh, SSI rules, and we heard a little bit about that before. There's changes in administrative enforcement. And then there are the behavioral consequences, and this is the heart of what I'm going to talk about, behavioral consequences in the failure of the, uh, of the uh, system to properly assign the real cost of DI to employers, and uh, the behavioral consequence of the failure to provide uh, uh, properly assign real cost SSI disability for kids to the states. Okay, so uh, what's endogenous? Well, we've heard this before. I won't go over it uh, any more than say that those things are the, uh, those conditions that are most difficult to assess are the ones that have been rising rapidly. Others have not changed very much. Uh, they now uh, musculoskeletal plus uh, mental other mental issues are now 56 uh, percent of the uh, population on the DI rolls. Uh, if you look at SSI kids. Uh, that says other, other medical conditions, should be other mental conditions, has increased from 5% 83 to 55% in the uh, SSI kids program. And we have the Sullivan versus Zebley case in 1990, which expanded the vocational consideration conditions to equal that of SSDI. Uh, so what else? Administrative enforcement has changed, and these are other things we've heard today. What we're seeing is a growing use of vocational considerations. Uh, and a, uh, with regard to kids, uh, an increased use of functional uh, equals listing, which is the equivalent of vocational considerations for kids from 5% to 50% in 2008. So clearly, it's become easier to get onto the rolls. Uh, whether that's a good or bad thing, that's a political decision. This is really a discussion of why the rolls are increasing. Some people should say that's great. Everybody, every, every poor kid should be on SSI. And every unemployed person ought to be on DI, if that's the way you feel then you should feel good about these things. All right, but what does it, why does it matter? It matters because increasingly we're having marginal cases. And this is a, a very important study by uh, Mastis, Mullen, and Strand, which is forthcoming the AER. And one of the things they do in, in their estimates of the effect of, of program factors on uh, employment of people with disabilities is look at um, cases in which the conditions are so much the same that uh, it's really uh, a random decision, depending on whether they get an easy adjudicator or a hard uh, a, a initial adjudicator, uh, to hear their case. And they estimate that 23% of applicants are marginal entrants, that uh, 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 if you look at those marginal entrants who stay on the rolls, that they get a yes and stay on the rolls, their employment uh, uh, drops, obviously. But uh, for those people who um, are not on the rolls, uh, their employment doesn't drop to zero. It doesn't drop anywhere near where uh, the employment of people on the rolls drops. Uh, so that the net effect of this is a 21% uh, 
point fall in employment of uh, the rejects versus uh, the, the people on the rolls versus the rejected control group. Uh, this is much more important for less severely impaired uh, workers, can be as much as 60%, less so for uh, non uh, more severely impaired people. In, in, in new work that Autor and Duggan, or, I'm sorry, that Autor and Mostis and uh, Mullen have done, they've also shown that the uh, length that you're in the program in terms of before the decision is made has a scarring effect on your chances of getting uh, into work at all, whether you uh, come onto the rolls or whether you don't. So uh, there's a program effect in terms of getting on the rolls, but there's also a program effect that, that uh, affects you even if you don't get on the rolls. Okay, so uh, we've heard this before. Uh, it's interesting that we hear that the disability program is supposed to be for people with disabilities, but in fact, uh, economics matters and it becomes an unemployment program uh, uh, for people who lose their jobs in recessions. The bad news about the program is that uh, these people stay on the rolls after the uh, initial uh, uh, recession that caused them in the first place to try and knock on the DI door is well over. Uh, so what are the endogenous factors in terms of uh, the failure of the program, the structure of the program that leads to these, this kind of growth in, in, uh, in the population holding all the things that Steve talked about constant? Well, uh, there's a failure to assign the marginal cost of DI to employers. So firms payroll tax does not vary with workers' disability risks uh, so that employers, so for employers, this reduces their willingness to provide accommodation and rehabilitation. If their workers, uh, uh, and even more so if the employer has a private DI program. If an employer has a private DI program and he can help the worker get onto the DI roles, then that employer's costs go down. So this is a New York Times story. We've heard all the stuff about the other stories that have gone on in the last couple of weeks. This was in the New York Times. The program's incentives are such that it leads employers to help people to come onto the roles rather than to provide accommodation and rehabilitation. Uh, what else with regard to SSI? Uh, welfare reform in 1996 provides block grants, provided block grants to states that uh, are not decreased when the states move a low-income single mother onto the SSI uh, the Disabled Adults Program or they move a child of a low-income single mom onto the SSI Kids Program. Uh, that has led to the states helping their workers ha ha have helping their low-income people onto the SSI program. Uh, that was the This American Life story two weeks ago. There's some additional actors here. Lawyers now provide their services to DI applicants contingent on success. Uh, we talked about the ALJs. Uh, the, the, um, uh, it used to be uh, that a lot of people in the Social Security Administration, at least when they weren't in front of the press, were unhappy with this and thought that it would be appropriate for uh, the uh, government to have its own lawyers there to protect uh, uh, the institution from uh, lawyers on the other side. Uh, that isn't happening. Firms specializing in placing TANF population on SSI, that's now happening. Parents of SSI kids whose benefits his child improves in school. These are all incentives in the program that are un unhelpful. Okay, so what's the fundamental policy? Uh, what's the problem? It's not uh, an issue of morality, it's an issue of incentives. The current program has the wrong incentives to get accommodation and rehabilitation to the people who need it. That's because DI is a great last resort benefit program after all of the returns, after all their efforts have failed, but increasing the SSI is, is uh, becoming a first resort program uh, and SSI does not manage cases at, at, at the work limitation onset when work treatments are most successful. Uh, they get into and any efforts to uh, change DI to, to outreach and get them to the point where uh, they can do something when it's most likely that accommodation and rehabilitation has, occur, has occurred is not going to happen. That's why we need employers uh, to, we need employers to be encouraged to provide uh, this kind of accommodation and rehabilitation and that's not happening in the current system. Solution uh, is a, uh, a workers' compensation kind of program in which there is experience rating and then employers will have skin in the game and try to uh, and in fact act more appropriately. The same is true for SSI. Uh, SSI should never have been chosen as an agency to administer SSI. They're not a welfare program. In fact, SSI is really a welfare program, much closer to TANF than it is an old age insurance and design. Why SSI was chosen, I think, is Bob Ball's uh, bridge too far. Uh, 
It has never really been uh, the, the uh, Social Security Administration is not in the business of providing incentives to work for its people very well. Uh, states do that, and they do it very well through uh, TANF. So what are the solutions? Let's uh, devolve SSI to the states and uh, let them deal with this, uh, give them the same kind of block grants that they do with TANF, place the real cost on moving uh, onto SSI onto the states. States have, provided, uh, have been very successful in managing these kinds of populations. Let them now have skin in the game and uh, what they should be doing for SSI kids is getting their moms into the workforce and then using the additional money to actually treat the needs of those kids to get them into work when they're age 18. Uh, somebody wanted, they wanted to see the Netherlands. Uh, here's something that's interesting. The Dutch were the sick country of, of uh, Europe in the 1980s. We are now exceeding the number of people uh, that are on the rolls. If you look at the number of people on the disability rolls in the United States, DI and SSI, relative to the number of workers who are actually employed, uh, you'll see that we now, after the 2008, exceeded that, and with that, uh, I'll end. So we can, we, can, we can beat the Dutch if we try hard. <laughs> All right, we have a little bit more than 10 minutes for audience questions. If you'll ask your question, I'll try to repeat it so that it will be, uh, the, it'll be uh, people on the tape can hear it. So questions or comments? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. It, we'll bring the commenters up in just a minute. This, this is just time for the audience to say whatever they want to or ask questions. Yes, right here. Uh, yeah, the question was, uh, talk a little bit about the Mastis paper that's uh, going to be published in the AER. Uh, this is a, a really uh, an exciting um, uh, study. It was uh, uh, done using Social Security Administration records, and Strand, who's in the audience, I think, uh, is uh, a member of the Social Security Administration. Um, uh, it's an exciting study because they were able to actually um, have the records of all of the um, a DRC, DRC is that, uh, I think, the initial uh, disability evaluators, and knew uh, their history in terms of uh, whether they were more or less lenient uh, given the characteristics of the people before them. And uh, so what they observed was that uh, there was, uh, of, of the cases that were decided, 23% uh, of the cases were decided based on whether they uh, had an easy or a hard evaluator. And that, that was just the first part of what they were doing. They were trying to get a control group and a treatment group so that they could then see how much of a difference it made uh, if you looked at the, um, at the uh, uh, group that didn't get on the rolls versus the group that did, given that they had the same characteristics. It was just the luck of the draw of whether they got a hard or easy person, and then looked at their subsequent employment. And what they found was that the employment of those people who did not get onto the rolls was more than the employment of those people who did get on the rolls. So there was a program effect. That's, that's the point. And what it suggests is that there are uh, some share of the population, and they argue it's 23%, uh, but there, there is a, 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 some share of that population that could work and hopefully could work even more if they hadn't wasted a year and a half before they were denied and went through their uh, their initial cases. Well, listen, go ahead, ask your question or make a comment. Go ahead. There was a comment. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, from, I'm not a statistician or, or an analyst, but giving rather a practical um, uh, commentary on disability as an advocate for getting people on Social Security, but on the other side, also returning people to work uh, who are disabled. And what we're seeing after 35 years of being in this business is that more and more individuals that come to us to get on Social Security disability, and we do handle their cases and help them uh, with that process if, if they you know, so choose, uh, and we feel that they have a great case, many more of those individuals at some point in time during the process or after the process of getting on disability benefits have the ability to return to work either on a part-time or a full-time basis, many of those individuals. So uh, the work that I have been doing is working with uh, individuals, sometimes with very severe disabilities, and sometimes, and many more times, the marginal disabilities, to return them to the workforce in a very successful fashion. So I think the administration really needs to take a look at their continuing, I think Mark Duggan brought up continuing disability reviews as a way
way of getting people off the rolls. It is a very effective way if it's used effectively uh, and something that we are not doing. And there are a number of employer groups, insurance carriers. Again, I think you mentioned insurance carriers. Uh, they have a benefit for people getting on. The insurance carriers that I work with, they're putting the majority of those people back to work with one to three percent of the total disabled population ending up pushed towards Social Security. So I think that we can learn from them as well, those front end early uh, cases. You look at the workability very early on in case management within the Social Security process to determine those people who are going to be successful or have a path to success <coughs> for a return to work. So, so I, I think there's, that, that's a very important point, and, and I want to emphasize that, and this is the case with me, and it's certainly the case with Mark, no one's talking about kicking people off the rolls. The real issue, the way to do something about the Social Security system is to slow down the movement of people coming onto the rolls. But I'm, I'm just saying something that's going to be uh, echoed by everyone else. If you're going to do that, you want to do that as quickly as possible after the onset of a disability. That's where we should be putting our energies. And the issue is, how can we set up incentives within the DI program that induces those people who are best able to do that, maybe the employers, to do it? And that's what experience rating would do, and that's why I would support it. And to me, that makes for a stronger uh, DI program, one that will be much more likely to, uh, to prevail without major uh, funding issues in the future. Yes, Steve. Yeah, just I guess kind of like a little bit coming from maybe a question. I would just caution on using ten-year estimates on anybody in the room who's had experience in actually doing estimates and projections, longer-term, really just near-term projections tend to be kind of extrapolation of recent experience. But just looking solely at ten-year projections it can really be a little bit misleading. You have to, you have to look beyond. They're yours, though, right, Steve? You agree they're yours? I, I agree, and I'm, I'm telling you as a person who has yep. actual experience in making these projections. Fair enough. That's It's not my paper. Oh, okay. Mary Daly's paper that she did with, with whoever else. Uh, and some of the extrapolation of trends that she had in there, that little sort of band where she showed we're projecting as being at the bottom end. I commented to her that I thought that was a little bit interesting because what she was doing at the top end is assuming that some of the kinds of trends like the closure of female incidence rates relative to males and therefore increasing incidence rates would, in effect, continue up. Now, one can posit that and females will cross over in the future, that's fine. But of course, there's another possibility that, that was not shown in that little fan chart, which is that rates could in fact come back down. So she only picked off things that could go up, showed that, and then our projections are that things that appear to have stabilized, and if you look at incidence rates that really appear to have stabilized, that we project that they will stabilize age sex specific. But didn't you do that the last, the last three times you did it? You also did that and they were all flat and it turned out they weren't that no, didn't turn out to be the case? Actually, we, we in, our, in our trustees reports, you should look, we do not just, do. just go back to the, the, we, we the, the little chart that I did where Mary did your numbers and got those flat things, 2006 and 2001. We have uncertainty projections for high cost, low cost, and stochastic that go in both directions. The, the uncertainty that she portrayed was only in one direction relative to current experience. That's my own OK, thank you for that, Steve. Other questions or comments? Uh, you mean in terms of their response to the CPS data? I'm, no, I'm, no, no, I'm just saying that they, you were talking about transferring this to the employers. And a lot of no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't come from that. That's correct. And, and my second question, I, I guess this is another question. Uh, you talk about incentives, and I worry about unintended consequences. If we have the employers having to bear some of the costs of this, then Yep. Great, okay, so I'm very glad that you're asking that question because that presumes there actually is a problem. So now that we've established there's a problem, we need to do something, let's think about what we can do. And what we need to do is think about uh, how we can get more skin in the game, how we can get somebody to be providing this accommodation or rehabilitation. And that's what experience rating does for my work 
you'll see that uh, in the ILR paper that I did uh, last year, uh, firms are much more likely to uh, uh, provide accommodation and rehabilitation to someone who's injured on the job than they are for uh, people whose uh, disability is not related to uh, coming on the job. Uh, what we show is that uh, when uh, the ADA rules actually uh, required um, uh, them to provide more accommodation, what that mainly did was increase their willingness to accommodate uh, people who weren't on the rolls. So I think there's a real possibility that this will have positive effects by getting uh, them involved. But you've raised a very good point. Anytime you have labor protection rules, you have to worry about employers getting around them by not hiring people. But that's true of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, remember when we said that uh, employers couldn't hire black people, people or couldn't discriminate against black people? Said people, uh, the argument was, well, they just won't hire those black people. So what I would say is we have to worry about that. But here's a simple thing that we could do. For people, for instance, who have uh, impairments, uh, we could, and, and, they, and they're, they're trying to get a job, if they would declare th that impairment, then they wouldn't be covered under the experience rating of the firm. That would be a general rate. And uh, that's one way to go about it. There, there are a number of ways to deal with those issues once we all agree that there's enough of a problem that we need to do something. If you deny that there's a problem, then of course you don't have to worry about all these things. I think some of us in this room have been in self-denial for a long time. And hopefully the facts will change that and we'll realize there is a serious problem. All right, we have time for one more question. Yes. We're going to run out of time, so okay. try to, Quickly. yeah. So when we could not get the two panels to agree on a case, what we wanted to do is find out why. And we went in and we made them identify what, what it was about the claim itself, that they couldn't decide which way and agree. Um, and there are many factors, socioeconomic and demographic, within the claim itself that Social Security also knows. There was also, they identified the quality of the medical evidence, the time, and I think this has changed. When is the onset, and if they could align the time, they could often do it. But there are ways, other ways besides the hard-headed, soft-hearted to look at it. And I'm not saying that those weren't outlying panelists within that, but it, there's more there that can be explored. I, I think it's a very difficult job to yes. make these decisions on the margin. And yes. if I said hard-headed versus soft-headed, I did that as a, a just a term to get it out of the way. Um, it's very difficult, but there is some variation, and some have a, a consistently uh, are on the yes, and some are more consistently on the no. And as long as they're consistent, I guess they're consistent. But it's very difficult, as you know, to get consistency across adjudicate against within states, let alone across states. So there's a real problem there. All right, so now we have time for a break. We're going to start again at uh, a little after 10.15, and we will start on time. Thank you.